I'm Peter Hinchens, and you're listening to The Changelog. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Changelog, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 205, and on today's show, we talked to Peter Hinchens, and we talked to Peter about some really deep subjects. Specifically, if you follow Peter, you know that Peter's dying. He has a metastasis of bowel duct cancer in both of his lungs. He's not expected to live very long, a couple months based on what he's told us. This is a sad show, but at the same time, a happy show because we talked to Peter about his extensive open source career, his career in software, the books he's written, how he's given back, how he cares about open source communities. Such a deep, deep show. I I really hope you love this show because this is one of those shows for us that just was uh, magic to make, and uh, it was a pleasure to, to have this time with, with Peter. Our first sponsor of the show is our friends at CodeShip, and I talked to Ethan Jones about the high performance and security of their new Docker platform. Take a listen. So we built CodeShip with Docker with security very much in mind. So at the start of every build, we spin up a fresh EC2 instance. At the end of that build, we spin that instance down. An instance is never reused even between your own builds, much less between builds uh, of any other customers. We also don't do things like cache your dependencies or cache your images locally on our infrastructure. So rather, we support remote caching for those things on your own repos. And all of that is basically to get to the point where your code code is never living outside of the CI/CD process. None of your application is ever stored on our servers and nothing you push through CodeShip is ever going to be saved, persisted, reused, artifacted anywhere once that build completes other than the explicit commands you run in the middle to do that. The side effect of that architecture is that because these things happen on these EC2 instances in the middle, that gives a lot of flexibility for performance because you can scale up that EC2 instance or scale it down based on the trade-offs you're looking for. So if you want a lot more resources or if your application has a ton of read write ops or a ton of memory usage, we can sort of up that EC2 instance for your builds. So it makes it really flexible in this sliding scale performance way, but the conversation was really more around security and around keeping everything as protected as we possibly could. How nice is it to get uh, performance as a side effect of security? Yeah. That's awesome. All right, that was Ethan Jones of CodeShip talking about performance and security with our new Docker platform. Head to CodeShip.com slash ChangeLaw to learn more. Tell them we sent you. Use the coupon code the ChangeLaw Podcast 2016. Once again, the ChangeLaw Podcast 2016. That'll give you a 20% discount on any plan you choose for three months. Head to CodeShip.com slash ChangeLaw. And now onto the show. All right, we're back for another show. We got Peter Hintgens joining us today. Uh, and this show, Jared, like many shows we've said before, has been, you know, pretty much years in the making. I remember uh, linking out to Peter's blog several times over the past couple of years in Change Law Weekly. And if you're a reader of Change Law Weekly, you've seen that uh, lots of great uh, recent posts from from Peter from that blog there. But uh, what's the best way to open the show up, Jerry? We got a fellow that's been in decades of software development, leading communities, zero MQ, mm-hmm. living systems, several books, an expansive blog. I mean, how do we how do we open this show up? What's the best way? Yeah, it's a it's a tough one to know exactly where to start. Of course, we always like to talk about people's origin stories. So, Peter, we definitely want to hear that uh, from you. But maybe we'll first mention that Peter's a large majority of his work is in building distributed systems and protocols, and he's written thirty protocols. And even recently on his blog, he's written a protocol for dying, which I think is something that we'll definitely have to talk about as well. Yeah. Peter, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you, guys. So I guess the, the way we typically start a show like this, especially with someone with such deep history, uh, I'm sure you've shared it sporadically or specifically in your blog. I haven't seen an exact post that just shares your history. There's been some recent uh, posts that have touched on that, but... How far back should we go to find out what got you into software development? So I, w- I was very lucky because I chose computer science in the days when this was just a very young thing at university. It was the first year I think they had this in York University in England where I studied. And it was the most boring, tedious, horrible stuff. I, I, I was just better than the math, which was even worse. Stuff like, you know, database normalizations. And I, I couldn't stand it. And... 
my mom bought me a little computer, a VIC-20. And I began writing uh, games in BASIC, as many kids do. And then I began writing games in Assembler, because the BASIC was limited. And then Commodore very kindly sent me a Commodore 64 and a printer and a disk drive for free. Wow. And I was selling these games. And the Assembler was, was kind of... It's, it's a lovely CPU. It's a, it's a risk. It's got almost it's got eight instructions, I think. It's almost got nothing in hardware. You do everything in software. And I got into this just obsessively. And, um, and I was doing really badly at university. I mean, I was getting, you know, like 30%, 40%, 60%, really bad results. So I, just, I took a year off and just programmed for a year and, and made games and sold these games and paid off my university costs and so on. And then after a year of that, I went back to university and picked up. And it was all new. I had not seen this stuff before. It was all from the year that I'd missed, or the year after me, kind of. And it was so easy. And my brain just kind of switched into absorb mode. And I understood how things worked in, in, in the computer, you know, in computers and software. I figured it all out. And, and I could just pick up a syllabus and read it through one time and understand it. And that's how I went through the exams and got really good results although my end degree was pretty useless. And so there was this kind of love with, you know, making difficult things work and learning it. And I was really, really good at that. And I, I got a job building tools. This was in Belgium where I ended up by mistake, thanks to military service. And I got hired by a company, although they thought I was much too young, but they hired me anyway, despite that. And that we were building tools in a small team for this huge company selling really crappy business software. But Using our tools, it was pretty good business software. And so I was always building kind of infrastructure from the very beginning, tools for making other things. What do you think the reason is for that? Why do you think you were attracted to the infrastructure side versus like a front end side or something? Well, you know, selling games is fun and getting checks in the mail with money or even cash in the, in the mail is, is, is a great thing. But when you make stuff that you can give to other people to make stuff with, then it's somehow more fun for me. You have this, you see the results of your work multiplied and you can make things that can last longer, that can be reused above. Yeah. And I really like that when you make things that can be reused over and over again, the tooling and the layering in, in software has become for me the most important thing, the reusability of what, what, what I design. You know, you start with this, this is going to last for two weeks. This is a very simple thing. People will use it, they'll throw it away. And then you think maybe it will last for six months. And at some point in my in my work, I said, okay, this thing I want to make, I want to last 50 years, which it didn't. What we were making then was a, a protocol, which was quite trashy in the end, the MQP. But that concept of, you know, making stuff that lasts 50 years came out. And I think that's a valid goal. Do you think anyone else entering software today has that kind of goal? Right. I mean, it seems like we're in a instant gratification, you know, kind of keep it and throw it world today where something new comes out every year and, you know, Everybody says a year in software or in, in the internet world or internet age is like seven years, similar, they compare it to like dogs or whatever. Um, do you think people have that kind of perspective? And if not, why? I, I don't really think it's a generational thing in the sense that there was a time when there were more hackers than there are. I think that's like a, a certain slice of, the, of people that just really like to understand how things work and are interested by, by solving that kind of problem. And have the capacity for it, because it can be very difficult. Huh? You're talking about concentrating on things for months and months and months. And concentrating on the right things, that's also very difficult to figure out what we're to actually work on. Yeah. And I think that, that that mindset exists constantly. I think that before computers, it was doing other things. Today, it's still there, and it's still looking at problems which are very difficult. Maybe not you know, the same level of problem as we worked on when I was 20 or 30. But I don't think it goes away. That's an interesting perspective to say, you know, to find the right things. I know... Jerry, you could probably uh, share the sentiment with me. I think it's, um, you know, the journey to find the right thing for you to work on. Like people say their dream job or whatever, mm -hmm. how, whatever term you want to use to describe that. I think it does take a, a while, especially as chaotic as technology is these days to get into it. Mm -hmm. There's so many layers, you know, there's so many things just to, just to get to ground zero, which is writing code is sometimes a journey all its own. You know, I'm, it, it's, it, it, people have that problem every day. But finding the right thing, you know, the right thing to work on. It seems like, Peter, you found the right thing fairly early and then just sort of iterated on that right thing for you. 
It's pretty random and there's all this constant pressure to do the wrong thing. And people paying you, people right. telling you what you should be working on. There's these huge waves of fashion in software that, you know, this is the new thing and everyone should be working on this. And I guess I was very lucky in my first job to work with a guy, Leif, um, a Danish, kind of a crazy uh, astronomer, programmer. And he had this very simple rule that, you know, everything is bullshit. And the more people shouting something, the more it is bullshit. <laughs> And his thing was to always look at the mass market and then look where they were wrong and look at the little areas where you could do things that everyone considered to be impossible or crazy or stupid, where there was actually real profit. And he had a real talent for that. And I think I picked that up and, and, and used that kind of for a long time, that things that were impossible, things that were, you know, outside the mainstream experience were almost by definition going to be more interesting than what the mainstream was doing. Peter, the right thing for you, if I'm following along, is low-level communication protocols. Um, mm -hmm. In a, and, and I'm sure you do other things as well, but that's you know, that's kind of your quote-unquote claim to fame, especially around Zero MQ and the legacy that you've built up with that project, and the communities that you've built um, over the years. In a recent post, when I reference a protocol for dying, you mentioned that. You were lonely as a young man and, and perhaps even somewhat autistic. And I always, I always think about people who, who focus on protocols, like as their life's interest or as the thing that excites them or that they're good at, because um, they're so necessary and they're so low level. And of course, ultimately, it's, it's a mechanism or a way in which two parties can communicate. And I wonder if this loneliness, this autism, perhaps or your desire to communicate with people and you didn't have that, does that play into your fascination and, and your life's work around protocols? So the protocol I'm most proud of actually is one called C4, which is a contract for collaboration. It's the, it's the rule book that we use in the ZeroMQ community. Mm. And it's a protocol, it's defined as an RFC with all the formality and it explains how the group of people who are trying to make some software should work together. And I'm really, I really like that protocol call because it, it works really well. I mean, we've tried it now for years and it just, it works mm -hmm. almost magically well. And it's written kind of from an autistic viewpoint where you don't, you don't really care what people feel as such, but you do care that they do feel. And so there's this kind of very brutal approach to human nature in there where, you know, how do you solve bike shedding? Well, you look at the emotions involved. You look at the, at the, um, why people argue. You look at the fallacies that people have in their minds and then you, you reposition the things so they go away. And to do that takes a certain distance from, you know, it takes a certain distance. If you're involved and you really care too much, then you can't do that, I think. So I love, I mean, I love working with people and I've, 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 I think I'm, I think I'm hyper social. Hmm. Um, I've made hundreds or thousands of friends in the last years as I've gone around the world with conferences and so on. And that's one of my great pleasures and happinesses in life is people, other people. I appreciated that what you had to say in that article. Uh, well, in this article, especially around your desire to reach out to when you, when you go to conferences, I had never really thought about it like that. Like everyone there wants and expects to talk is, is a quote I'm pulling from, uh, from that, uh, that post of yours. And you, you said you rarely talk about technical issues and uh, read the code if you want, you know, and it's kind of funny you're on a yeah. podcast like this to obviously talk about this and many things. And we'll probably talk about some technical details, but you know, I never really thought about when I go to conferences that what people's desires are for going there. And maybe even in your case, you know, Jared's question to you and how you're saying you're a bit more hypersocial. I think it's kind of interesting, you know, to, to pursue these strange, you know, chatting with strangers or being in unique situations to sort of force yourself to, to, to talk to people like that. Yeah. And this, this hit me a while back. It was a very, I was in a panel debate in a conference in Greece. And we were discussing, someone was asking about the physics of software and why bridges don't fall down and, you know, software does. And it just, I had this, just this wise crack answer where I said, well, the physics of software is people and psychology. And you figure that out and you can make solid software. And everyone was just, they were just dumbfounded. They had no answer to that. And this struck me as like, okay, that's it. That's the key to, that's the key to what I want to do is, is people. And it's our limitations and how we work together that lets us build big systems. I think this is becoming 
proven and obvious now, but then it was kind of a bizarre thing to think about. You know, we, we, we don't work well alone. We work well in groups. And, and how, do you, how do you organize that? It strikes me, that this interest of yours, um, I was surprised when you agreed to join us on the show. Um, and just to kind of point out the, the elephant in the room, if people are wondering why Peter is writing a protocol for dying, um, hmm. is that you're terminally ill. You have, is it a, a, you said a metastasis of bile duct cancer? Yeah, so I'll tell you the story briefly. So about five years ago, well, it must have been about seven, eight years ago, I ate some bad sushi. That's what I think happened. Mm. And there's this little parasite that um, lives in fresh farmed fish in Southeast Asia. And if you don't cook the fish or really freeze it very solidly, then this parasite gets into your duodenum and attaches itself to the bile duct and begins to produce carcinogens. And this is one of the major killers of men, men specifically around 50 in, in many Southeast Asian countries. But these are very poor people. And this disease is basically just an ignored disease. Wow. Um, it's almost unknown in the West and it's almost unknown in you know, wealthy countries. And so there's been very little study into it. And there's very few people who survive the diagnosis. Uh, and my family has no history of cancer. We have no, I have no liver problems. I mean, I do like to drink. I've always enjoyed that, but I have no liver issues and I have no, you know, other reasons for cancer. So um, I guess a few years fast forward and I, I begin to turn yellow. So I check myself into the hospital and, and they have a diagnosis of eventually of, of bile duct cancer and it's operable. They say, yeah, we'll, we'll cut you open. And this is terrible, terrible operation. It's a, they rewire my, my whole digestive system basically. And I shouldn't have survived that. that normally that was, I already diagnosed bile duct cancer. You're dead. That's, that's, it's very fast moving and it's a very difficult to, to see it until it's quite late. So I've had five years to put things, put things in place. And, you know, I've, al- I've always felt that this was like borrowed time. Um, I, I didn't take it. I was very happy to survive, of course, but I was kind of, kind of euphoric for about a year. And then I began to figure out, okay, what happens if I actually die? And I've begun to put things into place little by little and aim towards, you know, being, being replaceable, being redundant mm-hmm. um, in as far as that's possible. And then I've had scans every year, every six months, blood tests and so on, and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then this year in um, yeah, February, March, I have this cough which won't go away and I go and get the scan finally. And it turns out it's come back and it's metastasized in both lungs and it's, it's pretty, pretty invasive. And so my oncologist looks at me and says, well, yeah. <laughs> and uh, now we're doing chemotherapy, which is also pretty, pretty brutal. But it's really just for show, I think, for data. There's no, there's no, real, there's no real evidence that this, that this cancer responds to any chemo at all. Mm. So, yeah. So, yeah, you have, you have limited days. And so I was, I was quite surprised that you'd be willing to, you know, spend an hour and a half uh, yeah. on a Skype call with two people you've never met before in your life. But then I started reading more about you and, and your life's work around building communities, not just around building software. And this interest that you have in, in meeting people and, and seeing new perspectives yeah, and how that's one of the things about your life that you've loved. And so then it started to clarify why, why you said yes. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, it was even a, uh... It was even tough to ask him to to come on the show. I don't know if that made it actually into the show or not, but just you know, I've been fans of Peter's for years now, and and uh, it was just a touchy subject. I was like, I don't know if that's okay. Is it okay to ask somebody to come on the show, <laughs> considering like we've wanted to have you on the show for years, and it just never, uh, you know, became a thing. We just never reached out yet, and you know, I guess in that note too, you always feel. I mean, this is a side note for just in general, but you always feel like you have time, you know. Yeah. And whenever you're hit with the, the moment when you don't have time, it, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's obviously not a good thing, but you sort of kind of keeps you in a high gear to, to make some action and do some things. I think you hear my kids in the background. That's okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's perfectly fine. My three lovely little kids. Well, I have time actually, because I'm, I've, I've kind of stopped, I've stopped programming for the, for the moment. I don't think I'll start again. Um, I'm still writing. I just got a, I got a thing today in the, in the um, delivery from, from China, I think called Freewrite, which is a, this bizarre steampunk typewriter, which I'm trying out. And it's quite fun. 
So I'm, I'm writing and I have time. And this is, I mean, to be on the podcast with you guys is just absolutely awesome. I would do this every day if I could, seriously. Okay, well, we won't, we won't feel bad about then. <laughs> Um, let's, let's crack open the, the, the idea of this protocol. I, I noticed in the, near the end, you said you're not going to open an RFC for this, which is a request for comments. Hmm. I, I guess, walk us through how you actually, since you've had such a history with protocols, how you actually write a pro- protocol for this. So I had these biopsies done and a bronchoscopy, and it was the most horrendous thing. And from that, I got these infections in my lungs. So I went into the emergency with my, my whole right side of flame. And they pumped me full of antibiotics and I went through this whole thing and I was lying there in bed and I finally got my PC after about a week, my laptop. And one of, one of my readers said, look, why don't you write an update on the article you wrote about, you know, five years, uh, surviving cancer, five years. So I just turned out this article and I said, yeah, a lot of people talking to me and I see a lot of kind of, there's a lot of strange interactions when you talk to somebody who's obviously very, very sick and he has eternal diagnosis. Right. So let me try to frame this as a, as a simple human readable. It, it, I didn't want to make it technical, kind of human <laughs> readable um, story that people can look at and say, yeah, okay, okay. Um, and I just turned this out. I didn't really edit it or go through very much, go through it very much. From where I was lying in bed, very sick. And it was, the thing is, when you're feeling really bad in hospital, at least for me, having visitors and having people talking to you is, is a real pleasure. Like the worse you feel, the better it is to have company around you. That's the irony. Yeah. I don't think everybody has that experience. With me, that was how it was. I had days with like 10, 15 people coming in to see me. People coming in from everywhere, from America, from Finland. One guy flew down, Consta, flew down to see me. It was amazing. And I wanted to capture the, the positives of that and, you know, what felt good and the negative. Some people were very strange and I wanted to document that and say, okay, these things that people do sometimes are very strange. And you can probably, if you document it, maybe people can learn to avoid doing it. Yeah. I certainly appreciate the, the way you frame it with Bob and Alice and you, you sort of remove <laughs> yourself from it. It's not like this is what Peter wants, you know, but it, you know, it's the, it's the, uh, the thread, you know, that's, that's uh, ran through that with you writing it, obviously. Um, you know, but Bob being the dying person and Alice being the person who, uh, what she should not say to Bob. Um, I, I mean, I know I've seen people say in, in Facebook comments, like I've, I've been sadly in a family where we've had several people die. And so we've, we've had some experience in my family with loss and, and people passing from us, whether it's from cancers, instant death, uh, you know, like heart attacks or things like that. And we've, you know, I've been a family who've, who've suffered loss and, you know, on Facebook or, you know, someone says something, whether it's like early news or it's actually after someone's passed away, they see all these weird things like hang in there or keep hope or, you know, all these things that, you know, they're just trying to be polite, but in the end, it's just not constructive. It's not helpful. And in the end, it's just not loving. And, right. and so, you know, speaking of this protocol you've written in a human readable way, and I think that the way you've written it from Bob and Alice's perspective, even removing you from this, where it's not like a personal offense to Peter, because nobody, and even this show, like Jared and I, we talked earlier about how we um, had this, you know, uncomfortable feeling of, of having you on the show, not so much because of you, but because we didn't want to offend you. You know, and I think that's what's interesting about this protocol you've written in a human readable way to share with people what to say, what not to say, and even how you've embraced lots of people in your hospital room when you're, you know, when you're in the hospital and what that's like for you. So I, I think that's pretty, that's an interesting perspective when it comes from this protocol you've written. What I've noticed, and I, I think there's this real taboo about, and well, it's a taboo caused by, by distance. I mean, we've, we've lost this kind of naturality to, to dying. It used to be that we died of mostly of old age, um, surrounded by our families in our own homes. Um, I mean, probably to, through lack of medicine and proper care, but death was something that everybody participated in. And we've, we've lost that. I mean, most people, apart from, yeah, most people die away from home. They die in hospitals, they die in, in road accidents, but they, they, the dying isn't a social process anymore. And that means that the living are very, very uncomfortable with that. It's become something taboo and hidden. And when you have to cross that boundary and talk mm-hmm. over it, 
what do you do? What do you say? There's just no, no culture for it, no background for it anymore. We've lost that. And I think that's avoidable. And I think, so I'm, I'm really lucky to be in Belgium as well. I mean, I didn't like this country in the beginning. I came here by force. I was conscripted and I was like, okay, screw you guys. It's still a year of my life. But it turns out to be a pretty good country. And they have laws for euthanasia and planned death, as I like to call it. This notion that you can construct your own, your own death properly. And I saw this with my, my father who died at Easter. And this is how we did it as a family. He had euthanasia. He was very, very, very feeble, very old. And it was a very mm, loving and calm and untraumatic way to, to end someone's life, which was, he was going to die anyway. I mean, it wasn't about, you know, killing him. It was about changing from a total lack of control to, as a family to, to control. And... I think that's something which will become more accepted worldwide as a kind of a human right. This notion that you can control your own destiny, you can control your own death. And I, I like that aspect of involving people in that process, little by little. That dialogue with people, even with, you know, even this podcast, we're discussing yeah. my, my death. And that's an, that's an interesting thing, which I, I find It's a healthy. first for the show, honestly. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's something we definitely haven't done before. And it's it's something <laughs> I never even expected that we, that we would do. I mean, uh, when the show first began, our tagline was open source moves fast, keep up. It's still part of our, our mantra, but just that we cover the fresh and new of open source. And this is the most unique open source out there that we've ever covered, which is a protocol for dying. Um, you know, it's of, of many things we'll talk about with you today. So it's not the only thing, but it, I think the reason why it makes sense to bring that up early is because it doesn't make sense to, to talk about it later in the show. Like it's something that the listeners are going to know about right away as a, as a foundation for the conversation we're about to have, uh, right. and go deeper into it. And it, actually, this is probably a good time to take a break. Um, we're, we're about 20 or so minutes into the, in the show and, and a time for a break, but Let's come back and touch on a couple of the things that uh, that you say that are positive ways to to talk to to someone who's dying. I think you mentioned things you like, for example. So let's mm -hmm. take this break. We'll come back and talk about some things that are constructive to talk to you. So that way, when other folks feel invited to speak with you, um, you know, whether it's on Twitter or through you know some social way or actually face to face in these upcoming meetups, you have they have a you know aside from your post, they have you actually saying some things that help them understand how to talk to you and how to treat you. And so let's take this break and we'll be right back. Every Saturday morning, we ship an email called Change Law Weekly. It's our editorialized take on what happened this week in open source and software development. It's not generated by a machine. There's no algorithms involved. It's me, it's Jared, and the rest of the Change Law team hand curating this email, keeping up to date with the latest headlines, links, videos, projects, and repos. And to get this awesome email in your inbox every single week, head to changelaw.com slash weekly and subscribe. And we're back from the break and we're talking to Peter uh, about a protocol for dying. It's it's uh, obviously a unique thing to speak about, but uh, Peter, you've done very great with uh, making this readable by the world and and sharing different ways to talk to someone and, and to not, not talk to someone around uh, who's passing away. Uh, walk, walk us through a couple of the things that, you, that are positive on the positive side, how to speak to somebody that uh, is in your in your situation. So it's actually quite simple. I mean, it's company. It's having people around you. This is, this is how I see it. Having the presence of people, having people beside you. It's funny, the, the, you know, the worse you feel, the nicer it is to have somebody there who's just present. And if we're going to talk, it's going to be about the things which are in, in my mind. I mean, being Bob, then I'm very selfish. Of course, I'm, I'm obsessed by the tubes in my arms and the effects of the chemotherapy and how much I've been vomiting that day and how, you know, how it's better than yesterday and how, how tomorrow will be. And my focus is very limited. I'm not thinking about next week or next month. I'm thinking about the next few minutes, the next few hours. That's, that's when, I'm, when I'm sick in the hospital. If I'm at home, talk about other things and we can talk about stuff that we've done. We can talk about, you know. I mean, if you're in the hospital and you're sick, then it's, it's as Bob, then your mind is on, on that. And if you're at home and you're feeling better, then your mind is elsewhere. But what it really comes down to is, is having company and having, having the excuse to... to to be together and to, to chat about just random rubbish without it being heavy or difficult or painful and without there being this emotional burden. I mean, that's the worst is 
the emotional burden, people who are very sad or who feel very confused. Um, that's, that's almost impossible to deal with. Yeah. I think the key thing about the protocol, right, was, I mean, the parts about what to say, what not to say, are they're, they're quite trivial almost. The key thing was involve people, involve other people. It's like, don't, you know, don't hide your, your, your sickness, don't hide your situation. Don't be afraid of what people will think of you. If you're actually that sick that you're going to die, we're all ashamed of being, you know, vulnerable and being seen as vulnerable. But if you're going to die, you're going to die. And if you if your doctors tell you that you're terminal, then, you know, tell people about it. Be honest about it. Assume, don't assume the worst as a kind of a, you know, the worst possible case, but be practical about what's what's a likely outcome and involve people in that. And once people are, understand that you've accepted it, then they accept it. And it gives your it gives your community, it gives your family, your friends time to grieve and time to prepare and time to go through that process with you. And it I have I have another I have a friend who has, has breast cancer. And seven years ago she was diagnosed. She had a small scan and she just refused any treatment. And that was her solution was to deny it completely. And she said, I'll fix it myself with a diet and with whatever. And seven years later, she's still alive, but the, the cancer is eating her up. And she's not told her parents. She's not told her friends. It's a big secret. She's really ashamed of it. And when she dies, and she will die, it will be absolutely catastrophic. Nobody will have the chance to have said goodbye or to even have understood it. So I think that's the key thing about this protocol is, you know, be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your, 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 your community, your social circles, your family, your friends. One aspect of, of that and preparing for death um, is sorting out your life, you know, closure, wrapping things up, making sure that your desires moving forward are held. That's something that many people that don't aren't, aren't ready to deal with their own death um, or they feel like it's far away from them often right. don't do. And so you leave people in the lurch because they don't know what you wanted. Yeah. Um, for instance, you know, put you, you're supposed to create a will when you're healthy, not when you're sick, because you never, you never know when your life's going to be over. So in many ways, it's, it's an opportunity that you have, you know, we, all of our days are numbered, but yours are particularly numbered so far that you don't think you have very many of them left that you can actually put your, your things in order and you can pass the baton. Um, right. you know, you have kids, you have family. And so you have all those aspects, which are the most important things in terms of passing down your desires and, your thoughts and, and making sure that your kids are well established and who their father is and all that. Um, but from, from the technical software community side, these things that you've been really your life's work in terms of community building in the software space, there's a lot of stuff to think about there as well. And it sounds like you've done some thinking on how you actually pass the baton, for instance, in the zero MQ community. Can you talk to us about that? All right. So this has been a, actually a long process. Um, I've been working for years to make myself redundant. So I'm, I'm the gatekeeper of the community. I'm the benevolent dictator for life. <laughs> um, and for a long time, I had to feed the community. I had to put a lot of effort and quite a lot of money into it. I got the money back. I mean, I got, I got you know, good business from being the Zero MQ guru. But it was, it was a big upfront investment and it was a continual investment in keeping things straight and keeping problems away from the community that were potentially very dangerous. And so it was a very deliberate thing over the, the last few years to make myself less important. I was always a contributor and I love writing code, but I didn't want to be the person making the decisions like when do we make a release or do we merge this patch or is this person a valid contributor? I wanted these decisions to be made by the group in a decentralized, autonomous, reliable, re robust fashion. And that succeeded. And that's kind of the core of our, our process, the C4 process is. So we, we still have, of course, dependencies for things like domain names and trademarks and ultimately the deciding, you know, the deciding voice when there is a, a real conflict or a real issue. And I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, I'm very lucky to have the time to do this, but also I'm very lucky to have a group of contributors who are Absolutely amazingly good. I mean, the level of the people who've come to, we have these hackathons once a year in Brussels, 
before this huge open source meetup called FOSDEM. We had these hackathons for a few days. And the people who come there are just awesome. They're amazing. And one of them is, is, is my friend Doron, who is um, an Israeli, who is, he's a bit younger than me and has more hair than me and smiles more than me. But he's been using our process. He's been using ZeroMQ. He's the author of the Windows NetMQ uh, library, which he's rewritten three or four times. And the man is, he's a fantastic developer. And I've seen him work with people and I've seen him basically as a younger version of myself. So I'm like, okay, Doron, um, you, you idolize me. I'm going to give you the baton. And he's like, my God, what do I do with that? I'm like, okay, basically I'm going to pass you the domain names and I will tell the ZeroMQ community that I've, I've chosen you as my successor and they can argue, they can bitch, but that's, they won't. I mean, they, they trust me and it's a good decision. And it comes down to actually this very interesting situation where we have no foundations and we have no committees and we have no centralized infrastructure. Um, we have one guy who owns a few domain names. He owns essentially zeromq.org and pays for that and has the consensus agreement of the community that he's the guy in charge. And that's it. And it's a very lightweight baton to pass on. Imagine that there was a, you know, a foundation with a, yeah. Yeah. a board we'd be in years of argument. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually an interesting thing you bring up. Cause I mean, just uh, a year back, we can rewind to IOJS and node and that separation, that forking process yeah. and fragmenting the community and then uh, the obvious corporations involved. And now there's no GS foundation, which they're doing a lot of great stuff, but in light of this scenario here, I guess it's maybe a bit more specific when you have a BDFL model, right? Right. Maybe that's a little different. Whereas in the Node.js Foundation, if that's the example we're given, with, since I've said that, it may not be the only example, but it may be a little easier to pass that baton because there's there's no particular, you know, BDFL in place. There was, right. but there isn't anymore. And I guess that's sort of the walls they've been breaking down. I mean, that's an interesting topic all its own. And the foundation model is one that I've 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 used and I've I've been part of um, several times, and it can work very well. The problem with it is that it has specific uh, weaknesses and it's vulnerable to, to hijack, basically, and it's vulnerable to interference by bad actors. And it's actually quite simple. You can just get onto a, onto a board by pretending to be a good actor you mm. know, for a while. And then you start disrupting things and you can destroy an entire community just by sending a few emails and yeah. praising the wrong people and attacking the right people. And it's so easy to do. And I've seen this done, and I've been at the receiving end of that in, in large communities, which were destroyed as a result of that. And the cost of setting these things up, the cost of having meetings and regular meetings, and it's just endless, endless friction. And so one of my ideologies for ZeroMQ has always been utter decentralization. Every project is autonomous. You know, projects agree to use the rules they want to. Any project doesn't want me as dictator and didn't want me as dictator, just didn't choose me as dictator. It was very simple. I was only there by, by approval of each project. No. And there are hundreds of ZeroMQ projects, thousands even. So it's a, it's a model which is, I designed it very deliberately, I think, based on having seen many worse models in my life. And it seems to work pretty well. How about things, maybe this is going a little too far on the subject, but how about things around your corporation and uh, some things I noticed on the ZeroMQ site with uh, support models and contracts like that. Is that, uh, how does that change? How does that translate uh, as part of this? So I never, I never tried to make my company a, a very dominant, um, it's visible, but it's kind of visible on the margins of ZeroMQ. We've always kept ZeroMQ as a first class citizen and the business as a second or third class citizen around that. Um, most people that use ZeroMQ never ask for support. They don't need it. And there's a few customers now and then, people who are potential customers who want support. They need it. They want a contract of some kind. They hunt around for a contact address and then they email me and ask for, you know, consultancy or for a support level agreement, whatever it is, a service level agreement. And there has to be that. I mean, it has to be some kind of commercial hotline for people that want to pay. Right because otherwise you leave money on the table, which is just silly. So I assume that whoever takes over, yes, I mean, whoever has taken over, Doran will replace iMatics with his own company. My company will, will, be, will be folded at some point in the future. 
it has no real, I mean, it has no real structure. I've always kept it very small, just myself, really. Maybe we can loop back around to your C4 protocol. As you said, it's your the thing you're most proud of. And, um, and perhaps I'm a little ashamed I hadn't even heard of it until you mentioned it. So um, maybe it deserves to have some light shed upon it. Collective Code Construction Contract, which is a hell of an acronym. Or a C4. Hell of a, yeah. C4. Uh, what's that word? Uh, alliteration. When, I, when we get everything starting with Cs. Um, this seems to be a model that you said is working really well for zero MQ. I'm a curious, you know, exactly what the model is and if there's other projects that are using it, if it's, you know, something that you think more people should be using, but they aren't give us the, give us the details on C4. So where C4 came from was we've been trying to codify best practice in our community. And of course I like writing protocols. I like writing, you know, well, contracts, honestly, I like writing contracts, weirdly enough. Protocols are contracts. And we had this, we had a number of really, really big problems in our community for, for years. And these problems were difficult to understand because they were hidden by all kinds of layers of stuff going on. But it boiled down to the conflict between a few very dominant contributors and the mass of, I would say, less aggressive and less ideological uh, contributors and users. And this conflict is, is very real. It happens in many projects. And you'll see it when the, the core maintainers um, go off on an on a ideological tangent. They, they annoy their whole community. And it can be very, very disruptive and very destructive. And so we had this problem. And I was the person trying to keep things calm and trying to make stable releases while there was you know, two or three major unreleased versions still in the pipeline, each one breaking APIs and breaking wire protocols and completely out of control process. And it ended in a fork, which was, I thought was very satisfactory. And as it ended in a fork, which I provoked by writing the, the first version of C4, where I said, okay, look, um, I, I own zero MQ. I mean, it's my trademark. I've invested in this and everyone here is welcome, but you are basically working on my property. And these are the rules as of now. And the rules are that we will aim for maximum participation. That's our first goal. I don't care about the software in terms of its code. I care only about the people and the way they organize. And I trust that they will make the right software. And that's already is a very uh, brutal mm -hmm. statement to say to people who are focused on software first and people. It seems so counterculture. Yes, it's a, very, it's a very aggressive thing to say. And that annoyed a lot of people. Well, a few people. And then I said, right, this is how I, I see it working. Um, first of all, we, we use pull requests. I'm tired of this, this kind of cargo cult model we had where you post your patches to the mailing list and somebody may or may not merge them. Well, it works for Linux kernel, kernel it'll work for ZeroMQ. It's a trashy model. It's based on no understanding of actual dynamics. It's just based on trying to imitate other projects. Like, will you going to use GitHub pull requests? That's it. End of discussion. Everybody can use GitHub. Everybody will use GitHub or whatever platform we're using. It may not be GitHub in 10 years time. And then I'd been using this approach for my, my book, The Guide, where I'd basically been merging people's contributions. I had pull requests, people sent me code and I merged it. And I noticed that there were very few mistakes. And people got things wrong. People made bad, bad translations of, their, of the sample code. I wrote the sample code in C and people would translate it to every other language and send the pull request. And people got it wrong, that's fine. And others would come in and fix it. But there was almost no misbehavior. And I was merging pull requests and I just stopped reviewing it. I just began merging everything, just blind merging. And it worked very well. I'm like, okay, this model actually works. So I began discussing with other maintainers and writing blog posts about this notion of being much more accepting to, to contributors and not reviewing their code aggressively, not making value judgments above all on their code and moving towards a kind of a contract where you can bring in any, you can solve any problem you must solve. You can bring in changes to fix problems, but you may not break existing applications. And that's the core of C4 was this process for welcoming contributors and defining rules that forced maintainers to be welcoming, even if they might have their personal opinions and to give this kind of, this right to anyone. If you're using our product and you have a problem and you have a solution and you send a patch for that, you know, that solution, it will be merged onto master. 
on our main development branch if you follow a few basic rules about, you know, style and about the size of your patch and so on, commit message. But we will not judge your patch. And that's completely radical in our business, this notion that the ideology of architecture is a problem rather than an advantage. And this notion that your elite ninja programmers are your, your actual, your handicap and not your asset. And it made a lot of people very worried when we started that. And then we noticed that our contributions began growing. We had more and more patches. The email lists became very happy. There was, there was been no arguments in the email list since then. No more strange discussions about who did what and why. Um, now and then there are, you know, pull requests with threads, which get a bit long and they're not merging it. I go in, I just press the merge button, <laughs> end of discussion. And bike That's shedding awesome. is finished. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's very simple. If you have a problem with someone's pull request with their patch, you make your own pull request on top of it. It'll get merged as well. And this notion that you can fix problems by moving forwards, not by focusing on the problem. Right. It's it's so powerful. I think it's so many so people simple. get fractured and and, and paralyzed yeah. by that. You know, I mean, it, yeah. you seem to have like really struck a chord with this because one thing I love the way you opened up with focusing on the people. Right. I mean. Sure, you're creating software, but in the end of the day, it's the humans behind it that's creating this thing, and only by the stability of that uh, of that community around a project or a code base or whatever will the actual source code become positive in its own in its own uh, mission. You know, and, and that that to me is so profound to think like that, and so countercultural. I kind of mentioned that earlier as I tried to interject a little bit, but I didn't want to interrupt. I just think that's so counterculture that's not it doesn't seem like that's how it is out there in the open oh, source way now I, it seems like this is so yeah. different and unique i'm more extreme than that so i mean i'm i'm a i'm a i'm kind of way out there sometimes so i have this <laughs> although you know my job has been for many many years software architect and I, I build architectures and software and i can plan out whole systems and layers and layers and layers and they will be built and they will be shipped and they will be they will work I'm okay that's my it's been my job for many years but I've come to believe that architecture is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. Um, it's a bit like this meme I saw of a, some kind of a weird um, dog. It's been bred and it's cross-eyed and it has, you know, broken ears and it can barely walk. And then there's a wolf and the, the meme is like, you know, evolution. And this is, um, yeah, what is it? Intelligent design, right? The second one, the, the bred dog. And basically... I've been, I've been pushing kind of silently for people to understand that evolution is where we want to be going towards rather than, you know, intelligent design. By that, I mean that as individuals, we're basically incompetent to be solving the right problems. We think we're competent. We believe we're competent. We, we tell everybody how competent we are. But in reality, we're blind. We're limited. We are... We are only looking at a very, very narrow area and we're, it's distorted by all these assumptions and fallacies and, and, and beliefs which are wrong. And it's only by um, incremental trial and error uh, with a large enough group and a diverse group that you can actually begin to solve the right problems. And if you, if you accept that, then you understand that the starting point is the group. Uh, you, you need the group, the collective, you need the diversity, you need the lack of friction in communications, you need the ability to challenge any, any assumption, to think quickly together, like a, an ant, an ant nest. I love the ant nest as a model. Ants are, are extremely successful and they have this, this tiny genome, I suppose. I mean, ants aren't very complex and yet they do really, really complex things. And I, I think that's a satisfactory, I think it's an accurate model for human behavior. And for, for technological um, development. And I think that the, the other model where the ant is somehow a super intelligent thing that can create out of its own brain is a lie. It's a fallacy. It can work by good luck, but it's, just, it's actually just bullshit. And so my friend Life would have, he had a, a thing from Texas called the bullshit repeller, which was a spray. He just <laughs> spray around yeah, right. when someone talked rubbish. And um, I think that's this conflict. Yeah, between the ninjas and the and the community is this kind of this you know the lie against the truth. Well, you definitely have the experience, you know, that bears it out. You've 
you've been probably there with uh, many opportunities to spray some repellent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's take our last repellent. let's take our last break, and uh, we'll continue talking about this as well as community stuff. And we have some uh, good closing questions for you as well. I mean, lots to talk about. We'll probably run out of time and think, man, I wish we had more time with Peter. But let's take that break, and we'll continue the conversation in a moment. For those of you out there who are super fans, and I mean people who care about this show, listen every single week, care that we stay on the air. We want to invite you to join the membership community for just 20 bucks a year, and we'll give you an all access pass to everything we do, access to our members only Slack room, exclusive discounts from our partners, 50% off in the Changelog store, and of course you support us so we can support open source. Head to changelog.com slash membership to learn more, and we appreciate your support. All right, we are back with Peter Hinchins. And Peter, we've talked about a lot of things on this call. We've talked about or around Zero MQ, which uh, is the project that I knew you for. Um, now yeah. I'm starting to think maybe C4 will be uh, your legacy. But nonetheless, Zero MQ, a very interesting project. And we've just been talking about the community around it and the way you've managed it and the way you're passing the baton on. We haven't given too much to the project itself, its technical merits, its history why people should be interested in it and even where it's headed. So can you give us the rundown on Zero MQ? Yeah, so the story is kind of, it's Prometheus and stealing fire from the gods and giving it to the mortals to cook their hamburgers on. <laughs> um, we, we got involved, me and, and a couple of other of my, my friends years ago in making messaging for the financial industry. These were my first major protocols. And I think at a certain point, it became clear that what we were building was actually really interesting for other people too. And the first people we were aiming at as customers were smaller financial businesses, small trading houses. And so we focused on raw power and speed and making it open source and trying to get license fees from these people who, of course, never paid anything because they were so greedy. They wouldn't pay a cent, but it was, it was great fun. And then... We, we kept making it simpler and more accessible. And at a certain point for me, it was like, okay, we've actually cracked the problem of building distributed systems. We know this stuff works. You know, our software ran the Dow Jones Industrial Average for years and it worked and it was really efficient. It was straightforward. Zero MQ is better than that. It's, it's 25 or 100 times faster. It's simpler. This stuff is really, really valuable. But our target audience doesn't really understand the problem space yet. And one of the biggest handicaps is the complexity <clears throat> of, of, of this whole thing. Distributed systems are very complex. And so we've been working towards making that simpler and simpler and simpler as a, a metaphor, as a model, as a, a, the learning of it. And when that works, it's a thing of beauty. So one of the stories on my, my article, people have been writing on my article all kinds of comments. And one of the stories from somebody is this guy who was asked to make a prototype for the NFL. They have put RFIDs on the players and they put little scanners around the field and they can collect all this data from where people are, where every player is. And they wanted a system to bring that data in and pump it out to their machines. And so this guy wrote in a weekend, a zero MQ program in C++ that pulled in and distributed. And it kind of worked and then he went off and forgot about it. And a while later, uh, his company folded, he was fired. And his friend at the NFL said, come, come, come work, come work, come work. And it turns out that his code was being used as the basis for the NFL's next gen statistics system, which is one of their products. And it's the same code, essentially hasn't been changed very much. There's a team around it, but the core of that was, you know, I don't know how many lines of, you know, 500 lines of C++. Mm-hmm. And it worked basically first time and it's still working. And it's the same, the same model has been working now for a year and a half and very successfully. And deployed as proof of concept, huh? And deployed in production already for, for yeah. a year. So it's being rolled out and it's a, it's a product. And this is thanks to a little library, which solving the right problems in the right way. Um, not, you know, for a certain class of application, right? Always. Sure. And so our... Um, our journey with ZeroMQ has always been to make that more accessible, easier to use, less 
wrapped in mystical terminology and in strange concepts that you can remove. And it's been removing concepts, removing concepts, making it simpler over time. Do you consider zero MQ um, complete or do you feel like there's a, there's a lot that can continue to remove concepts or continue to innovate um, beyond your direct involvement? So zero MQ is a community of projects. And so it cannot be ever complete. There's always going to be new things. Mm-hmm. We were speaking of Node.js and one of my last gigs was to build a Node.js binding for ZeroMQ, a new one, which I didn't manage to finish. Huh. So if there's somebody who knows Node.js and C++, because it says C++, Nan, it's a horrible beast. And if <laughs> someone is up to that, there's a lovely <laughs> piece of work there. Uh, probably impossible to do, probably crazy. In fact, I don't think anyone can do this. ZeroMQ is also the core library. It's the core messaging patterns. And in there, we're actually still simplifying those patterns. So for example, Doron, Doron Somach, who is the new mm, dictator, actually <laughs> implemented a, a bunch of new patterns, which are very, very simple. They're very nice. The names are nice. There's a client server pattern. There's a radio dish pattern, which uses UDP. Um, there's a scatter gather pattern. And these are simpler than the existing uh, patterns. They only take single message parts. There's no multi-framing. There's no strange structure in the message. It's, you send one thing, you receive one thing. And these are still raw. They will be, it'll take a year or two before they get into broad use, but they are very elegant and they're very nice concepts. And in fact, we stole that idea from the, the fork of ZeroMQ from NanoMessage, actually, um, which had this, this kind of approach, simpler. So, I mean, I'm not averse to people forking stuff and then us stealing those ideas back. I think that's great as well. Why not, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Makes sense. I've always wondered this myself as uh, as someone who doesn't go this deep into system software. And I, I kind of get the idea of what messaging is. But can you walk us through like a an overview for those out there who are listening and thinking like, you know, I just I'm following along. I get it. But what exactly is messaging in a system like this? Why does why is your MQ needed? What is it? What is the true problem right. solves? So if you're you typically you use TCP to connect systems and if you're using TCP, then you have to solve a a bunch of problems to make it actually work. You have to frame, because TCP is a stream of bytes, messages typically aren't streams of bytes. So you have to frame, you have to handle errors, you have to handle asynchronous, asynchronicity, because you'll have multiple threads in your application. One will be sending, one will be producing data, and the two have to talk to each other with buffering. You may send a thousand messages in one go, but the network may be quite slow. So you have this asynchronicity happening at all sides. You have to be able to deal with different languages. Maybe you have C++ talking to Python. Uh, maybe you have Java in there somewhere. Or do you, do you want to just impose Java on the whole, you know, your whole ecosystem? Yeah, maybe people do that. And, and so on. And you have these um, 20 or 30 quite specific problems that you do have to solve if you want to make production quality communications between two or two million pieces of software. And people do solve these problems over and over and over again. And mostly they solve them in an ad hoc way. They have a a library in their application, which they maintain, which is theirs, and which is never really looked at by other people, which is their best guess of how to do this. And it works, but it doesn't really scale. It has performance issues and they can do, they can push maybe, you know, 5,000 or 20,000 messages per second through this, through this stack. If you take that stack and you open source it and you put it into a community who are actually experts in distribution, then what comes out is much, much, much better. It's much better in, in every dimension, not just in performance, but also in stability, also in exceptional conditions, also in error handling, portability, and so on. And, it, and, and you get this thing which you can plug into applications or you can build applications around rather because it's a design tool and which solves these problems in a way which is which is really good which is effective which you can rely on and which lets you build now your distributed system without having to think about that that tcp stuff or that udp stuff happening between your pieces and i've told i've told developers this in conferences for for years now that if you're still building monolithic systems then you're building for the past now this notion that there is a computer in the building on which stuff will run is, you know, it's 1950s. And the modern world has 
billions of computers. Even my house has hundreds of computers by now, just my kids and their mobile phones and tablets. And for software to use this profitably, it must be distributed. It must be decentralized. And this problem of communication between these, these moving pieces is, is still really unsolved until you have something like ZeroMQ. And what you can build on top of ZeroMQ becomes then really interesting. Once you've, once you've taken away this cost, and we build stuff on top like, like Zyre. Zyre is a kind of a ad hoc a clustering library where you simply join a network and you will discover peers automatically and you can talk to them and broadcast to them. And it's reliable. So you can chat to peers and send them stuff and they will receive it if the network is very flaky. And it's, it's simple to use. It's, it's relatively hard work to make that, but it's doable because of ZeroMQ. And I've used Zyre, for example, to build IoT demos with clusters of devices that you switch on and switch off and they, they find each other, they can talk to each other, they can do interesting things. And it's just straightforward to build that kind of stuff now. It used to be impossible. It used to be literally years and years of work and now it's a few weeks, a few days even sometimes. So take us through like what, what systems out there are using. I mean, based on that, it sounds like this is like the, which makes total sense to have Ilya on the learning page, like to, to Ilya Gregoric, who's been a fan, you know, on this show yeah. before, internet plumber, so to speak, is that's his self-professed title. But it sounds like, I mean, that whether we might know it or not, that zero MQ is is uh, the foundation for which a lot of the stuff we might do day to day on the internet is built upon. Ilya was one of our first um, fans and and wrote about it and, and helped us to get yeah. some 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 footing. Um, the thing about Stuff like ZeroMQ is that you, we don't know who uses it. Really? Like, literally, we have no clue. I mean, there's, there's no registration process. There's no, you know, there's no, we don't keep track of downloads. It's um, completely invisible. And when things work, nobody tells us, obviously. So we only see a very, very small percentage of, of users. We see um, people who are absolutely incompetent to asking basic questions, which we've answered often in documentation. So they get told to read the guide and that's it most of the time. And we get people who want to contribute improvements. So they have hit the limits in one or other dimensions and they've gone through the code and they've understood the code and they're like, okay, I've got this problem. Here's a patch. And we have people using, using it in a way which creates a problem and they're asking for help. And then we have this very small number of, of, of people asking for commercial support and that's it. So 99.9% .9 of users are just off the radar and we have no way of, and we don't even want to, you know, keep track of them. It's not interesting. Yeah. Let's pull something from uh, this post since we're talking about Ilya. He, he talks about different ways that zero MQ is being used. And I guess for the listening audience, you know, hearing what it is and hearing how it's used is two different things. So let's talk about it in the wild. What, what are some things that people have built with it that you're aware of? Like in his example is a, is Mongrel too? I remember when Mongrel was a big deal mm -hmm. with uh, with Rails back in the day. But just some different examples of how they used ZeroMQ to build something else. One of the one of the largest deployments of ZeroMQ, and I mean this physically, is the the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, in France and Switzerland, run by CERN. And it's a it's a fairly classic industrial control SCADA um, problem. So they have this this 20 something kilometer ring. I don't know how many miles that is. A lot of miles anyway, uh, running around the countryside. And within this ring, they have a whole series of, of machines which are producing energy beams and amplifying them and focusing them and steering them. And these machines have to run, when they do an experiment, machines run in real time. They're, they're steered and guided in real time by a software network which has to be able to talk to them and tell them what to do. And that's the control system. The experiment runs for, I don't know, a few hours. I don't know how long it runs, actually. And they collect the data by smashing the beams together. And they have this huge, massive uh, receiver thing around the smashing thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that produces just a lot of data, which then gets sent off. And that's the, that's the data part. We don't, we don't deal with the data part. We deal only with the control part. And... So their control structure is they have these machines. Each machine has custom drivers, bizarre serial port control interfaces built by who knows what manufacturer somewhere. And they have um, these, these feed into computers, just normal little Linux boxes. There's, I think about uh, 500 or 1,000 of these computers. 
on a network, which then talk to central uh, systems, which tell the operators the status of every machine and allow the operators to guide the machines and the software which is doing the guiding for them, obviously. And that network is built using ZeroMQ currently. Yeah. And they nice. actually, CERN went through a review of different things they could use, and they were using CORBA before, which was, it's old, but it was, it was a well-known quantity. And they rebuilt their, their, their systems every, every five or 10 years. And they went through and looked at ZeroMQ and said, well, this is, it's the best software, but it has above all the best community. And we like that and we appreciate that. And, you know, community translates into, you know, lower cost also. You have more access to experts and so on. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a whole bunch of, of these ring. There's also an X-ray, an X-ray factory in Grenoble called the ESRF. And they're using ZeroMQ in a, in a similar kind of control system called Tango. And Tango is now built by a consortium of, of different um, X-ray synchrotons, they're called, around Europe and around the world now. And they're all using ZeroMQ as, as their messaging system underneath that. So it's become the basis for systems like this. this is, these are large systems. These are, these are big, big applications. And the scale from that, that weekend project I talked about for the NFL. Sorry, this is maybe confidential, but it's on my blog anyway. So I guess that's not confidential. <laughs> that, Too late, yeah, I that, guess. Yeah, too late. So that weekend project, uh, up to projects which are, you know, hundreds of people working on them. Um, whenever there is, you know, bunches of computers to get talking together and some smart person says, aha, we could use ZeroMQ for that, then there's a win. Right. There's a win for that person. He gets, you know, career. He gets, you know, competence and career and solves important problems and his, his organization wins money. Let's talk about an unusual topic, but... Uh a topic everybody has to deal with, which is bugs. And I was just thinking about, as you described, ways that ZeroMQ is built or uh, mm -hmm. it used in the, in the wild, so to speak. Um, how those like you and the rest of the community behind ZeroMQ must feel whenever they have to reproduce or test case a bug, for example, like to deal with something. And I'm on your solve a problem, uh, which is your, your uh, essentially your support page, not the yeah. contractual support or the commercial support, but like, bug fixes. And the first one says, make your re reproducible test case if you possibly can. And so I'm just thinking like in a scenario where you have uh, that ring and several machines and light beams and smashing, and uh, how do you even deal with that? So what is, what is bug fixing like for the community dealing with this? So first of all, when people are using ZeroMQ, if they're smart enough to choose it and use it successfully, then they're smart enough to build those large systems out in, in ways which shake out all the bugs early on. And they're obviously not spending a weekend wiring up the large Hadron Collider and then trying to see what happens, right? Right. Uh, so they have simulations and test benches and they have everything can be reproduced in isolation. And actually ZeroMQ lends itself to that really, really well. So um, if you look at the examples that I write, you'll see that it's always, they're always in, in the guide, they're always built out from simple to more complex and you can take every aspect and test it out and take every next aspect and test it out. So it turns out to be quite simple to isolate behavior in, in most cases. It's rare that you have really bizarre complex bugs caused by a bunch of different circumstances. That's the first thing. That's always been the case. But what's more interesting is that in the last years, we've really seen a drop-off, a dramatic drop-off in the number of issues and bugs in, in our code. I think that's deliberate, but that was kind of a consequence of this process, this magical process. The C4 process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually quite obvious. I mean, bugs come from code which hasn't been properly tested, which has not been properly hammered by people, and which has got speculation in there. Uh, code which is, you know, which is inaccurate. And when you hit it with actual reality, it, it performs wrongly and the things, things mm -hmm. crash or go weird. And the trick is to... Um, break down um, your development process into very small steps where each step can be tested. And I don't mean formally tested by scripts. I mean tested against, its, against someone's, actual, you know, someone's actual problem and validated before you go further. So we used to have in ZeroMQ, like I said, these waves of, of raw code coming in. 
you know, here are 5,000 lines of new code. Here is this whole bunch of new changes. And the bugs came from that. And they came from the time it took to, to weed out all of the inaccuracies in that code. Now we have, we don't have 5,000 lines of new code. We have, you know, maybe 200 patches. Each of them are five or 10 lines. And in some cases they're longer, but they tend to be quite small. And they're testable in each case. The patch is modifying some behavior which can be tested by a test case. So you've got a before and after for every change. Hmm. It's very hard to make that buggy. It's very hard to introduce strange behavior when your changes are small and they are testable. And it's like the ants going out. And this is why I, 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 you know, I get back to intelligence. The ants going out and foraging for food. And they, they make a small step and it's in the wrong direction. They can correct very cheaply. But if you take a bucket full of ants and throw them into a field, they're all completely lost. Yeah. Or else the buggy code is a bucket full of ants. And what we build are these very, very efficient little lines of communication where the ants have identified some interesting problem and they go for that. And the, the more they work, the more accurate they are. Quite literally bugs in this case too. I mean, yeah, using the ants as the model there. Well, let's so we have, sorry, we have people who basically they, they build on the master version of, of, of GitHub. Yeah, different projects. That's what they're using, and they go that into production with that when it's properly tagged, right? And you know, match that to our strategy of accepting pull requests onto master, and it gets quite freaky. <laughs> right. Yeah, those two worlds collide big time. Well, only they only appear to. It turns out they don't really collide at all. It's not as big of a problem as you'd think it would be. Well, the thing is that if you can, if you accept pull requests onto master, then when there's a problem, someone will fix it really quickly. That'll get merged onto master, right? So in fact, what you're doing is you're right. correcting master much faster than you would otherwise. I assume the people who are building like large financial systems or our monitors and whatnot probably are not on master too often. Probably not. Let's give some encouragement to those. Uh, I mean, what you just said there with uh, the major drop off of bugs is certainly encouraging for those who have heard of ZRMQ are into or want to get into this this space more so. Um, and we always like to give a, a good shout out to a getting started. So I know that you have a, a get the software page on zeromq.org that certainly tells you how to get it. But what is the what is your favorite getting started guide that you can recommend to the listeners? What's the best way to get started? I, I would say that it depends on your language. And what you do is you have to look for the language binding that you like best of all and then use that. Because the, the actual raw ZeroMQ is C++ wrapped in C. The API is kind of weird still. And it's not the best place to start. And even the documentation I wrote is kind of, it starts there and then it very quickly switches to using a higher level C API. So the best place to start is if you're, you know, if you're a Python developer, you take PyZMQ. If you're a Java developer, you take the, the JiraMQ. If you're working on .NET, you take NetMQ and so on. If you're a C developer, take CZMQ. And start with those and start with those examples and start using that. And then only go deeper as you need to. Only go deeper if you, if you have a reason to. And you'll find examples for whatever language you're using in the guide. The guide examples are in every possible language. But each of these bindings has a community also and they'll be, they'll be able to help you get started. But in terms of like... Learning ZeroMQ, there's just one, there's one, there's one book, and that's the one I wrote, which is called The Guide, and that's the guide to ZeroMQ, and that explains it. And that's, that's where you start if you're actually going to go through the, the actual process of learning this as an as a, you know, experience. So that's at uh, zguide.zeromq.org. So if you're listening, that's, that's right. a, we'll put that in the show notes, of course, but I just want to mention that here. So it's uh, the bullet points in the front of that page ex says explains how to use your MQ covers basic intermediate and advanced use with 60 plus diagrams and 750 examples in 28 languages. So you're obviously got, uh, um, I guess most of your languages taken care of because it seems like you've got, um, let me see if my notes are correct here, 40 plus languages that you're mm -hmm. covering in terms of bindings uh, available online in PDF format. So that's, is it, is it like your other books where you can read it online, but buy it if you want? Yeah, so it's it's available online. It's a, that's where it started. It's a it's a wiki. Um, but actually, it's one very 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 long page. People preferred that. It turned out I had first of all written chapters, and people were like, no, no, I want one page. I can print it off. I can go back and bookmark it, whatever. 
And it's also available as an O'Reilly book called Zero MQ. And there's also PDFs you can download. I mean, O'Reilly were actually very happy with us um, having it as a available online at the same time as they made the printed version. The printed book is really nice. I mean, it's a it's quite a fat book. It's a large book, to be honest, but it looks good in the bookshelf. Is it as thick as the JavaScript book? The, <laughs> the JavaScript I Bible. Know. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't have the JavaScript Bible. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, I guess one more one more topic here on ZeroMQ is. Uh, you know, we talked about community. We talked about the technology. Um, not just getting started, but where, how, how can what areas of the community can people fill in? Like, if it's if it's, uh, we always ask the question of how can the community help is essentially the the, the basic question. But where are needs in zero MQ, zero MQ, and how can people step up to to fill those needs? That's a really good question. You know, it's. It's. It, I think it's very difficult to to come in and contribute to a project which is already, which has already got so much mass. Um, it's hard to know where to start. So, certainly the bindings. Again, the bindings are the kind of, you know, these are what these are front end the front end deliverables to different language communities, and they always need help. Like I said, the Node.js binding I was working on. Um, every binding needs help in you know being updated in documentation and guides for that and so on. And if you're using a particular language in ZeroMQ and you want to help other people to use it, then that's a good place to start. I, I think also what's, I don't know if it's missing or it's just not necessary, but meetups, you know, finding other people who are using ZeroMQ or working on distributed programming in general mm -hmm. and meeting up regularly and discussing what you're doing and how you're doing it. There's the big problem of confidentiality. Most businesses don't like talking about their infrastructure projects. But apart from that, I think that meetups are really an interesting thing to do. And it's it's great to meet people who have the same kind of problems as you. Yeah. That's interesting that you say that too, because uh, you know, you're, you're so community oriented and you have such an influence around building community that, uh, that that's a need. It just seems like it's uh, out of place to have that need. Yeah. It seems out of place, so I'm not really sure if it's if it's absent because we've not worked on it or because nobody really needs it. Yeah. Um, but I've, I'm, you know, I'm involved in other meetup groups, and it can be a fun social experience simply to have people who have the same kind of problem domains as you, working on the same kinds of stuff. Um, and ZeroMQ may be a good excuse for that. And if I was using it and not really confident enough to contribute code to it, then that's probably where I would start. So I have a, if, if we're clear here, I'll, I'll switch subject a little bit. I have a question for you, Peter, that uh, I've been kind of waiting to ask here. So one of the things that you mentioned in your, your protocol for speaking to someone who's dying is, is to focus on, you know, the good things, to focus on life and, and uh, camaraderie and history and talk about old adventures and, um, you know, discuss the good things of life. And so you and I just met, so we can't really go back and talk about that, you know, the good old days when we were doing anything together because we haven't. But through your work with Zero MQ and uh, your writing and your your teaching, and like we said earlier, you've uh, been going to conferences all these years um, through your company. Uh, you've traveled the world and you're teaching, coaching, so on and so forth. Surely you've built up some good adventures, some good stories. And so I just, I'd love for you to just to share something with us just whatever comes to the top of your mind, a story of yours, whether it's software related or non, I know you have lots of, you know, non-software interests, piano, guns, uh, even though you, you don't seem to own a gun, which I think is kind of interesting, even though you're a certified <laughs> pistol instructor, um, drums, other things. So, you know, if you have a good story for us, I just love to hear it. Oh gosh, where do I start? I don't own a gun because I don't own a gun because in Belgium it's, it's very complex to own guns. Mm. Um, you have to have permission from the chief of police and you can only own, I think, one or two in there. It's, it's, it's a real hassle. Um, and I actually was working in Texas for a year for a company, Samsung. And there's not much to do in Dallas, Texas. You can drive and you can go shopping and you can go to nice places to meet people and there are lots of places to hang out and so on. A lot on. of food. A lot of food, a lot of beer. In Texas, it's almost um, illegal to not own a gun. Yeah, you, it's, yeah. it's a requirement. <laughs> it's the other you can't get a driver's doing. license unless you own a gun. <laughs> and I was doing this this workshop with a bunch of a bunch of people from Samsung. It was our first workshop there, and we were trying this kind of prototype uh, 
distributed system. And it was what eventually became Zyre, I guess. And they'd been trying to do this for, for some time and they'd kept failing, trying different ways to do it. So I, they had five or six of these really clever guys. All, you know, there was one from Kazakhstan, there was uh, a bunch of Americans, there was one from, I don't know, it was all very diverse mix of people brought in for this. And after three or four days, we had like we had built really amazing stuff and it was all working and little little video games working across four mobile phones and everybody was very impressed. And then just very randomly, I was like, there's got to be a gun range somewhere. And it turned out that the whole, the whole class were gun fanatics, shooting fanatics in one way or another. And there was maybe one or two who had never shot, but who were into it and willing to try it. So we found a range, went there and shot. And I was like, okay, I love, I love Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was cheap. It was easy. They were friendly. The guns were great. I was, I was able to shoot. So over that year, I must have, I must have gone shooting. Yeah. <sighs> a hundred times and I, I would shoot, I would just shoot, you know, two or 300 rounds of ammunition. Yeah. And I got really, really good at it. It's just a matter of practice. And, um, and then I decided at a certain point, this was a kind of an insane project. I mean, we all, we all went kind of batshit crazy in this project for different reasons. It was incredibly political and it was, we had been trying to do stuff that everybody wanted to, to do. And so when we had got some success, they were trying to kill us and take it over from us both people from inside the company and outside the company. And it was just endless, endless politics. And so my job was to navigate that politics and just kind of beat off all the bullies and keep the, keep the team together and alive and fed. Um, so at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my, my pistol instructor badge. So I look up on the, I become an NRA member. Really? Which I, yeah, because that's the NRA, the people who do the pistol safety, the gun safety right. in America, which is, which is a really good job. I mean, I don't like their, their politics. The politics is bullshit. Right. But they're, at least as far as I'm concerned, but their, their work on gun safety is really, really excellent. And so I went down to Waxahachie, Texas, and there's this amazing little gun school there. Uh, I think it's called the U.S., uh, I don't know, something, the U.S. something, weapons, something, something. Although we don't say weapon in the NRA. We never say weapon. We say gun or gun. pistol. Gun. Now, see, I was in the military, and it, was, it yeah. was against the rules to call it a gun or things yeah. like that. You had to call it a weapon. It was a weapon. weapon. Yeah. It was a weapon, yeah. Where's your weapon, soldier? But in the NRA, in the training, it's like, you don't call this weapon. And everybody yeah. in the class with me, they were all, they were all ex-military, all infantry. Um, you know, these, these big strapping men with tattoos on their forearms, like their forearms the size of, I don't know, and all aiming to get their instructor certificate so they could go off into security or whatever or become an instructor and it was this this stupid scrawny belgian trying to figure out how all these things worked and i knew nothing about pistols in detail and then i came to the practical exam i mean going out and shooting and of course if you've been in the in the army you're an excellent shot with your right hand your dominant eye and dominant hand as you as you know right um, but if you have to switch to your left hand and one eye, then you're, uh, you're the wrong eye and the wrong hand, then you're kind of lost, I guess. That was the case here. And so as this, this test went further and further, they was, they, they, they're just completely useless. And I'd been training both eyes, both hands. So I was the best, the sharpshooter, and they were all just so angry with me. And I was like, yeah, Belgium for the win. <laughs> so I had this. And then my, my, my family came to visit. My kids came. And I took my daughter to shooting, and she was seven. And my parents were so pissed at me. They're like, you can't take your kids shooting. What is this? Are you crazy? I'm like, well, she can shoot. That's good. She'll never forget mm -hmm. how to shoot. She's not afraid of guns anymore. And she knows how to point a gun in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And if ever a gun falls on the floor beside her, she'll pick it up and she'll know exactly what to do with it. So I'm, I'm personally neither, I'm neither gun nor anti-gun. I've never, I, I went shooting once um, at a friend's behest. I got a range and I had a good time. But yeah. it just didn't really trip my particular trigger. So I'm, oh, trigger. Uh, nice one. Fun. Uh, what is it about it that, that's so fun, that's so interesting? Is it stress relief? Is it the challenge? Is it the noise? What, what is it about shooting a gun that, that you enjoy? Well, it's, it's the pure machismo. I mean, for a nerd to be able to go off and shoot things, and I'm just joking, it's not that at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 technically, it's difficult. And so... When you're when you're uh, stressed, or if you have a lot of things to think about, and it's the same reason I enjoy drumming. Actually, it's the same thing with drumming. Then to be able to shoot properly, you your mind has to has to switch off, 
yeah. uh, s- certain level, completely switch off. And there's like even even your your reactions when you're shooting, like you you mm-hmm. your body knows the noise is coming, so you're going to jerk that that pistol up. You have to switch that off as well. So it's meditation. And if you get in the zone and you you you're not tired and you have you know your arms aren't tired and you're shooting, then it's just absolutely magical how well you can shoot. And then you lose it, then you lose it again. And so it's kind of aiming for that zone, and and it's a it's a form of meditation, and it's it's mm-hmm. it's fun. I like that. Um, there's also kind of the I guess for a European to be able to go shoot is kind of illicit, illicit pleasures for us. We don't have that really. Maybe I went shooting in Vilnius, in in Lithuania, where it's it's even more random than Texas. I have to say, but it was great fun as well. It takes a lot of breathing. Breath control is like the number one step for right. shooting properly, and you can't breathe well if you're fussy or thinking about other things and right. fidgety or frantic or whatever. That's why you know, like motion based shooting is really tough. Like uh, mm-hmm. the show Twenty Four, uh, uh, Jack Bauer. That's not real. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. That's, that, that never happens. You're that's never that accurate. That, yeah, shooting in yourself teaches you it, may, it makes it harder to suspend your disbelief yeah. when watching movies and tv shows because it's so yeah. outlandish that they can do anything near what they're doing that's cool I, it's peter i would have never expected you to come on this show and talk about and tell us a story about <laughs> guns you know i mean that, that you just blew my mind i mean especially even here in texas that's where i'm at it's houston texas and so dallas is like uh you know four and a half hours away from here and like I said earlier, it's yeah, it's not true. It's not. This isn't a fact, but it's it's basically illegal to drive without a gun. I mean, <laughs> it's just so common here in Texas. We even have a saying that has a cannon in front of it, uh, and it says "Come and take it" because we're so relentless with our guns. We have to keep them. It's it's a. I don't so much have this belief myself because I'm not a true Texan. I'm. This is a total tangent, but I'm from Pennsylvania originally, so Pittsburgh area right. is my steel city. Pittsburgh area. That's my you know home stomping ground. So I, I'm a transplant to, to Texas, but I don't. I kind of feel there's some similarities between Pittsburgh. I was in area Pittsburgh. And, yeah, I was in Pittsburgh last year, and I, I went shooting in Pittsburgh, and it was it See? was fantastic. Very yeah. similar. Yes, I mean we Very have similar, similar. I mean it's it's the U.S., but yeah, not all America. states share the, share the same things. But uh, right. come and take it is a thing the Texans say, and it's it's like <laughs> it's like whoa. that's machismo right there. Yeah, right? it is. Come and take it. Come and take it. That's machismo. Yeah. I wanted to make a conference called Guns and Code. <laughs> and I, I had the domain name, you know, Guns and Code, and I was going to do this in uh, probably on the, um, in Oregon, you know, rent a cabin and have, you know, have like a bunch of friends up there and just yeah. rent a bunch of, a bunch of guns and ammunition and, you know, randomly code and randomly shoot. Could be fun. I mean, I would, Could be uh, fun. I would attend. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got told it was a bit too politically sensitive. It'd be dangerous. Yeah, I was recently invited to a, a bachelor party, and it was bring your guns. We're gonna be shooting, and there'll be food there. <laughs> yeah, like that was just that was the invite. I was like, well, I don't have a gun, but I'll I guess I'll go and just kind of sit back from the main group a little bit and keep my safety. But we are quite a, quite a bit upstream on that. Let's ask you this, uh, Peter. So you've kind of you've wound your career down by choice, of course, because you're ill. Um, and so you don't have any, you know, career or work ahead of you aside from the, your writing, which right. I assume you're going to continue to do until you can't or until you don't want to anymore. Um, so you've accomplished a lot and you've traveled a lot and, and, and all that written books, given talks, so on and so forth. But what mountains are out there or what goals or problems are unsolved that if you had 25 years of a career ahead of you and not, if you weren't looking back and you were looking forward, um, what was something that you that you didn't get to solve or a mountain that you haven't climbed yet? Hmm. I guess the thing I was working on, which I had hoped to be able to push forward was, you know, the internet of shit. I mean, internet of things, sorry. <laughs> and I have this, I have this, this kind of this vision that the, it's not even a vision. It's just, I'm just predicting what will happen. The number of smart devices, number of computers out there will keep doubling every 18 months and it will keep doubling every 18 months and every 18 months again, doubling and doubling. And that's just the way it's going to go until the world is so full of computers that nobody wants more. And that's a long way off. And these computers have to talk to each other and they have to be organized into networks. And there's this whole fight going on right now about who controls these computers, who controls their data, who has the right to update them and so on. 
And so we were working on this this year earlier. I had to stop. I was really getting too sick to work on that. But it was about building networks of little computers. We were using OpenWRT routers, the, the Glee 150 AR. Uh, you know, it's $20 and it has this. It's absolutely wonderful. It comes in a small plastic box and it runs on the battery. Fantastic little device, completely programmable. I don't know how many megabytes it has, but enough to run our software on properly. And so my idea was, look, you have like a house full of these things controlling, you know, they all have IO, they have GPIO, you can control stuff. Um, controlling lights, controlling, you know, temperature, control, you know, sensing, sensing rainfall, whatever you want. And they cluster together. You don't have to configure them individually because there's too many of them. You just plug them in the wall and possibly connect to a Wi-Fi and that's it. And then you don't program them. Uh, instead, you, you send code to them. As I say, you don't program them by updating the firmware, you know, whatever is involved right now with this horrendous process of sending your compiled code to the thing. No, no, that, that's, that's, that's finished. That shouldn't be happening. Instead, these little devices should be picking up code from the network like a browser does and running it and then throwing it away. And so that's how I wanted my kids to be programming the light bulbs is, you know, write a bit of code, send it to the light bulb, switch on, become green, switch off at 1030. I don't know. Um, and if there are a hundred light bulbs, they'll all respond the same way. And if there's two, they'll respond the same way. And that notion of the internet of things becoming the web of little devices speaking some language, probably JavaScript, it'll be JavaScript, which is kind of sad, but that's, that's how it's going to be, I guess. I wanted to make that happen. And um, then I wanted to sell, aha, make money. How do you make money from open source? So I wanted to sell security on top of that and certificates um, so that you could get properly signed code that's from, you know, being authenticated. And this is a lovely area. It goes into things like mesh networking and so on. You know, devices can be also Wi-Fi routers. They can t talk to each other and you can build whole structures like that. Yeah. We just talked about mesh networking actually in, uh, is it 2 -0? 204, Jerry, what, what number was that we just released the episode? You gotta go to our homepage and find out. 203, Jewelbots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they had built, um, it's an interesting little project. I guess I shouldn't say little because it's quite big, but uh, you know, it's essentially programmable bracelets for kids, primarily girls right now, mm -hmm. but uh, getting kids into coding and programming those things, and they built their own little mesh network. Um, through them so that like if you walk up to another friend and they got the bracelet on and they're your best friend or whatever then they change a the color or they have some sort of tactic um you know pulse or something like that some unique interaction that that happens based on proximity in this mesh network which is kind of right. interesting yeah and that's totally up your up your ios or iot whichever you want right. to say yeah it's that proximity and that 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 um something that we lost in the internet, you know, the concept of proximity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been, it's been possibly the biggest, the biggest hurdle to, to people understanding what, what, that, what it really is. And, you know, you, we used to have proximity by, we used to talk and then we had phone calls, but it was still, you know, conceptually a wire. Even this, we have a, we have a wire that's connecting us somehow, but you know, you send an email to some address, which represents some person who may pick it up at some point in time. It gets kind of weird. And I think that there's something to be to be won back by recreating proximity as your as your connector, even if it's virtual. And and mesh networking does that. I mean, up to a point. If you have very large meshes, of course, you're back to the internet. That's interesting. Right. Have you documented any of this stuff? Is this? Uh, I think of like um, this isn't a one to one, but similar to to like Elon Musk, which must be some sort of flattering remark to you because. He's got unique big ideas that he's only got so much time to do so much, you know, Tesla, SpaceX, and yeah. you know, whatever else. I think this is like some interesting ideas, and you've obviously got some wisdom and some bloody knuckles from being in the trenches for so long and doing what you've done. Have you put this down anywhere that somebody can kind of pass the baton of the idea or the, you know, the possible idea? I write a lot, but it's, it's all over the place. I mean, I have lots of, if you look at my GitHub profile, you'll see lots of projects I've worked on and, and there's like desire that implements this concept of proximity. Um, CZMQ implements this concept of simplicity. So you have, you have different projects that do different things. And then I have my blog posts and it's, it's one of the problems is if you're, if you're writing lots of stuff in lots of places that you have fragmentation of, 
anything, which is a grand concept, which, which brings me to my latest book, actually, which we're going to talk about, which was um, somebody asked, and I have this question happening a bit too often. Okay, uh, how do I build communities online? And I have these different pieces of text I've written on that here and there, left and right. And so eventually I put them together and published it as a book, Social Architecture, which is, it's quite a slim. I actually got 20 copies from CreateSpace. I ordered them. And it's a nice little slim book, but it's like, this is my best practice for this particular problem. It's all in there. So, but that's extra work. I mean, it's, somebody will have to go through my stuff and right. figure out what I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a late article from you, May 17th, Building Online Communities. And this is, this is sort of a, a, I guess in your own words, this is an early draft from your book, Social Architecture. So is right. this, how close is this to, to that copy? That's about, I guess, about a third or half of the actual book in the end. Yeah. Um, I wrote the article first and then I went back the next day and re-edited it and added in more stuff and published it properly with a cover and so on. Gotcha. Yeah. So this one, we had some we had pulled out here um, for, for talking through. <laughs> thing. Like We've talked already through Fair Authority, I guess, to a degree uh, with Zero MQ and, and C4, but something that we've talked about uh Probably maybe a little, maybe almost too much. I don't know if you can actually say that, but we've talked about it quite a bit in like the last 30 episodes. It's come up at least several times, which is funding or sane funding, as you put it, mm -hmm. in the toolbox. And maybe let's talk about that one piece there from the table of contents. I, I know it's quite a bit of uh, stuff going on in there, but what are your thoughts on, on this sane funding? I know it's a short chapter for you too. Yeah, so it's... I think it's a problem which has solved itself uh, in some respects. So it used to be that to build a community, you had to have infrastructure, which you had to pay for. And that used to be a fact of life. You had to have servers, you had to have email servers, you had to have, you had to have, you know, stuff and it cost money and the money had to come from somewhere. That was the, that was the first problem. Second problem was that you had to do a lot of the work yourself. We hadn't yet figured out how to really bring in people smoothly and cheaply. And until we had C4, we didn't know how to do that properly. So the cost of infrastructure has gone away almost completely. I mean, right now, like I said, the baton for Zerium Cube, it's a domain name or two. And that's it. And the rest is hosted by GitHub. We could be using GitLab. Um, we have access to free email lists in different places and so on. So we don't have to pay for infrastructure anymore. And the second thing is that when we, then we come to the actual cost of work, that if the process uh, focuses on people who are using what you have, solving real problems and coming with their solutions, then it's self-financing. And that was a real breakthrough. I mean, at that point, we realized that we didn't need to be funding the work upfront at all. We could leave it. And if, People were not improving it. That's because they were not using it. Mm. And if they were using it, they would improve it. And they would improve it for their own benefit, uh, on their own pay time. And it, almost all of ZeroMQ is built by people working at office hours, being paid to improve it because it's in their own interests. And those improvements come back because of the license. And our job is to make that flow work as smoothly as possible. And uh, that's a certain point, maybe three or four years ago, where I stopped having to invest money. And so this thing of sane funding um, kind of has gone away, at least in software, where you can work with pull requests and incremental progress. Now, when I wrote that toolkit, originally the toolbox on social architecture, I was working in political uh, NGOs and non-governmental organizations um, fighting software patents in Europe. And the problem we had there was that we had people who were working full-time on very, very complex uh, technical legal issues, um, preparing, preparing drafts of amendments to laws that could be pushed through and voted on, analyzing what's going on. There was a, there was a really, really large amount of work being done by unpaid volunteers who were being basically exploited by their own organization. And it was very, very bad for them. It was toxic. And so my job, my first job was to fix that problem and find money to pay these people or stop them working. It was had to be either you stop working on this 
someone else takes over, or we find you a salary. And so that same funding concept really came from that, is that if you have people who are necessarily working on something, they can't be volunteers, they must be paid. Mm. Otherwise they, they burn out and it's a cult that you're building and we, we don't, you know, we don't like cults. cults is that, uh, pointing to the, the, the last sentence in that, uh, that section there, finally watch off for individuals to take on too much risk without adequate reward. They can that's be vulnerable right. to burn out, something I'll talk about in the next section. So that's kind of yeah. leading into the market curve, but, uh, I think that's a risk anybody, you know, any community has to watch out for is anybody who takes on too much without reward. Because we are, we're humans. We want some sort of, you know, affirmation back, even if it's a pat or if it's, even if it's not money, you know, it's some sort of reward system that has to, even in this case with NGOs though, you know, obviously they're getting not paid, you know, right by volunteering. So that's, that's yeah. a whole different version of burnout. Well, burnout I've looked at in, in from different angles over, over many, many years. And what I actually think now is that it's it's not so much to do with, you know, I work too hard in this job mm-hmm. or, I, you know, I gave too much for this thing. It, what it really is, is the dynamics of a relationship um, with, with a bad actor. That's true. And the bad actor is using a situation to exploit people and eventually they crack. And if I look at my own periods of burnout, in my career, and I've had it, I've had several of these. I look back, and I, I realize that in fact it was that there was somebody there who was being very, very exploitative and manipulative, and who was using people. And I was one of many who burnt out around that person. Um, hence, my interest in bad actors as a as a topic yeah. because they seem to be very, very influential. There's some people uh-huh. I know too that are trapped in scenarios like that, and it's so right. it's so troubling to hear you say this because I think about those kinds of people, and I've been there too, of course. But yeah. Um, we're, n- we're none of us are immune to it, but you just think of like what a trap it is. And it's, it's almost like, uh, the thing, Jerry, we talked about this once before where you, where you love the deceptor in a sense. And like, you've been offended by somebody, but you, you know, like, um, I'm thinking of, of things like where it's domestic abuse or something like that, where right. you, know, you don't go away. What was it called, Jared? Are you thinking of Stockholm syndrome? I think, I think we talked about that at some point recently. Stockholm some syndrome, sort of, yeah. Uh, where, you, you know, you Someone fall in love with the... Someone or taken, a, yeah, taken yeah, you, away from... You have this uh, unusual love or compassion for, you know, your offender, essentially. And you just don't yeah. see the truth. And you kind of get stuck in this trap. And So, that, that actually, the last book I wrote before the Social Architecture book was, it was about psychopaths. And because that is what we're talking about here, yes. you know, bad actors and the assholes yeah. in the world, the people who can who can use emotions as a weapon, you know, they get really angry and then it's gone and it costs them nothing. And they're never to blame. They're always the victim. They're they're innocent. They will never, ever see themselves as as a problem. They're always the the, the innocents in any situation, but they they manage to hurt everybody around them. And at a certain point, I'm like, OK, this this shit needs to be documented. I can't say I'm going to stop it because that's impossible. But, you know, what I do, what I do really well is I take complex questions like this and I break them down and I, I try to find decent workable answers. And I'm looking around the internet for answers on how to deal with psychopaths and there aren't really any good answers. And this is kind of weird. I mean, it's like the only, the only answer that people will agree on is run away. Yeah. Evade. It's like, you know, evade, break contact, leave. It's like, okay, that's fine. That's easy to say. But don't you get it? Is that the basis of this relationship is this bond which you cannot break. It's like the first thing that the psychopath does to you if you're in a job or if you're in a relationship is make sure you have no alternatives and make sure you're stuck. So who's this book for then, this psychopath, uh, The Psychopath well, it's, Code? It's for everybody. I mean, it's not written technically. I don't use long words. Well, I mean, a, like, what I mean by that is like, uh, is it for those who are trapped since we kind of was on that subject? Is it for people who are yeah. in these, you know, these these robbing relationships where they're being exploited or whatever, and they're near burnout. Is that the, is that what it's to, to sort of an early warning system, so to speak for those people? I suspect if you're actually in that situation that you won't be aware, aware until a certain point, And then you start looking for help. Um, you start looking online and you see this in, in forums on, you know, relationships and on, on, on other situations, people looking for help at a certain point, something tweaks in their mind, like, okay, this is not normal. This is, this has got to be mm. something else. This I am literally going to buy this book when we're done with this. Right. And I'm going to, I'm going to read this because the last line gets me. This book yeah. delivers practical tools and techniques to, yeah. su- to survive the most difficult people. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Jared's not one of them, but we got difficult nah. people around us often. It's <laughs> we, we we not Jared, so don't think that, Jared. But uh, we man, all do. that's right. And we all have and that. We all have that problem. We all have that. If it's specific to you know our our industry, then even better. No, no, no. It's it's uh, it's not. It's not. I, I I think that we're at least in open source. I think we have actually filtered out many such people. But there 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 are a lot of them around. I mean, it's. Like, what's the number one talent of a psychopath is, is, is stealth. It's hiding. It's not to be caught, not to be seen, not to be seen. And it's this cryptic thing. So you look around and you see normality. But it isn't really normal. There's this population of people who are, I guess, they're innocents. I mean, I'm not signing blame here. And in fact, in my book, you'll see that there's a lovely backstory to psychopathy, which is really quite fun. Mm. It's like, um, well, I won't spoil the surprise for you, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, fun, it's a fun thing. But this population of people, they cause a lot of pain. Yeah. They cause a lot of pain. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm not a fan of pain. I think pain is something you can reduce. So this is a painkiller, right? This is morphine. It's not going to stop psychopathy, but it's going to let you at least deal with it in a, in a way which reduces the pain. You can actually be in the same situation with the same difficult person, but once you've understood what's going on and once you've got tools for protecting your, 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 your mind against this continuous attack, then it stops. It stops. And I've done, I've done this. I've, I've, this is written from experience. It's not just me fantasizing about stuff. It's written from experience. I had to make this book for myself. Um, and it works. It works. It doesn't solve the problem of difficult people. They're still there, but their power goes away almost completely. So you've, you've written several books, obviously. Uh, a lot of them stem from either answering a question that you've investigated or direct advice from your mind. And similar to the question that Jared asked you earlier about mountains left unclimbed, uh, let's, let's kind of tee this question off to you in a, in, in a similar vein but, but different. What advice uh, can you give to the former self, to the developers out there, to the community of open source, whomever you tend to speak to whenever you, um, whenever you get into book mode or you get into advice mode? What what advice comes to mind most for you to, to those who are trying to be in this rich community of either creating software or pursuing creativity in software? Um, I think camping out there simply because our audience is software developers, primarily people who make things in, in and around software or even companies. What's some good advice you can give that isn't in a book you haven't written yet because you haven't written this? What's, what's some advice that comes from maybe a book you won't read or, or won't, uh, won't write. Most things are bullshit in our industry. <laughs> That's my best advice. <laughs> I learned this as a young developer and, um, so, you know, don't, don't trust the mass opinion. Seriously, trust your own intuition and look for, you know, areas where you can, uh, you can be special and where you, you can find yourself where you can learn, where you have space to practice. And just because things are fashionable and everyone is doing it. In fact, that's the reason not to do that stuff. Do stuff that's hard and that's different and that's, that's freaky. And of course, most of the time you'll be completely wrong and you'll be doing stuff that no one cares about, but you will learn and you will learn the hard way and you will learn well and you'll internalize those lessons. And to be like, I consider myself a happy programmer. Like I program happily. I write code. It tends to work first time the way I want it to work. And that, that took like 30 years to get there. So you need to be patient as well. You can't just, you know, learn something and then become a master in it. You have to internalize so many little lessons. And making mistakes, that's fun. Getting it wrong is fun. Just don't make huge mistakes. Just don't bet your company and your house or your family on, on something that you can't prove. You take small steps, make small mistakes, you learn. You, you make huge steps, you make mistakes, you die. And then my last advice is to trust other people. Um, not blindly, of course, as we've discussed, but you're part of uh, an ant's nest and your power is other people. It's not you. It's how you can bring other people into your world and be in their world and how you can share and build stuff together. That's the real power of, of a human being, whether you're a programmer or a writer or a cook or a taxi driver, it's other people. Mm -hmm. And that's my inspirational thought for the day. I love that. Thank you. Very good. Uh, one last uh, question for you here, Peter, before we close out. First of all, this has been tons of fun. I appreciate you giving us so much of your time. If you were able to 
pick your own legacy, uh, what you leave behind, what everybody remembers about you, uh, what would your legacy be and what would people say? Honestly, I'm, I'm very content with what I've been able to do so far. This was a, this was a decision I took maybe three or four years ago was to stop working for money as a first goal and to go out into the world and become a writer. I wasn't a writer before that. I hadn't written a few things, but to actually publish books and do that as a, as a, as a focused job, to go to conferences and to meet people and to, you know, go out there. And I began writing my blog three years ago, four years ago. Um, everything I've done since then is what I'm most proud of. I think before that it's, it's mostly, it, there's good stuff, but it's mostly, it's mostly lost to history and it deserves to be lost to history. And I think that's all the lesson is, you know, be yourself and be happy to be yourself and be proud of being yourself. We're all, we all have unique stories to tell. And I think that's our power. I don't think that you have to be an expert in someone else's story, um, but we're experts in our own stories. Well, Peter, it's, uh, I think it's been, uh, I don't know, I want to say like uh, maybe close to two hours, I bet. Um, it's yeah. definitely been roughly 50 minutes since the last break. I didn't think we'd go this long, but uh, I honestly couldn't hang up on you because you were just so much fun to have on this show. And I was telling Jared in the back channel, like, I dig this guy. Like, this guy's cool, man. And uh, <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Um, I dig you guys too. You know, this has been, this has been a real pleasure. Awesome. And we, real pleasure. We're, we're glad to share, you know, even though we don't have a history with you, we're glad to, to pull out some of your history and, and well, we do now. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we definitely, yes. we definitely do now. That could be our legacy. Peter Hinchins digs us. Digs us, yeah. I dig you guys, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, any any final closing thoughts before we start tailing out? Anything left unsaid that you want to make sure we bring up? No, I just want to thank you very much for this. I really do. Um, I, I feel very privileged to be on your podcast. It's um, I have to go and listen to it because I never listened to Changelog before, I have to admit. Um, and I'm a, I'm a modest person and this, this is, you know, very flattering and it makes me feel very happy. So thank you very much. Well, good. It was an honor to have you on this show. And like I said, we, we almost didn't ask you, um, be, simply because I wasn't sure how sensitive the situation was, uh, but we've been fans of yours for, for a very long time. And, uh, now is the best time, uh, as ever to, to get you on and, you know, in closing too, I want to mention a couple of things, and you've mentioned this in your blog, the last couple of blog posts around around your death uh, and planning for it, and 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 things like that. That um, that you've got a a PayPal link that we're going to share in the show uh, in the show notes, and that kind people have already sent you over ten thousand dollars in donations, and this money is going to go to your children's lives and making their lives easier when you're not not there anymore. And, uh, and so we're going to put that link in the show notes, but, um, the link just reading it out loud here is paypal.me slash hint gens. That's H I N T J E N S. So that's Peter's last name. So paypal.me slash Peter's last name, hint gens. go there. Um, and I, I think this is, uh, maybe you can even T and, uh, uh, step in here some Peter as well, but ways that uh, we can give back to you. I mean, just this podcast alone, the advice you've given through your books, the the ways you've given back to the community, C4, RabbitMQ, or not RabbitMQ, I had that on the brain, uh, ZeroMQ. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's a lot of MQs out there, but that's the one that came to mind for when I was saying that, so I'm sorry about that. But, you know, all this thing, all these things you've, you've given back, I just think, like, if somebody, if anybody could give back anything, whether it's buying a book, whether it's donating to this, uh, this, uh, this PayPal fund for your kids, you know, what are ways that you would like to see some action in light of your obvious scenario? What, what are some ways that you want to ask the community to step in? Buy the books. I, I prefer you buy the books. The, um, actually, I get a good, I get a good slice of the, the price on a paperback or an ebook. Amazon is very good for that. <clears throat> and when you, when you buy the book, then I can give you something which you can share with other people. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the nicest thing you can do. Well, uh, you heard it. You heard it here first. Buy the books, people. Buy the, buy the books, books, people. I, I think that's a, a good thing too, because I'm I'm gonna go and uh, buy several of these. There's a. I don't know why I haven't bought it sooner. I guess now getting from the a bird's eye view on what the the psychopath code and and your latest uh, is about. I mean, to me, <laughs> I mean, it it rings home for me. 
there's a thread on Reddit where I, I did an IMA on the psychopath code and I was absolutely trashed. What? I was trashed. It was, I was, I was, I was, I was murdered. I was told by people to kill myself. It was, what? you don't have the qualifications for this. You know, a psychologist, how dare you write about this stuff? And I'm like, wow. 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 And I got my bullshit spray out and I was like, psh, psh, psh. <laughs> I love Reddit, but sometimes. <laughs> and I like that book. I'm really actually very proud of that book. I think it works really, really well. Well, I think we've all been there, you know, and so talking to that with you, it opens my <clears throat> eyes to, you know, I'm always a fan of finding uh, great advice and books like that, that that speak to stuff like that because it's an unhealthy community and that's part of the charge of this podcast of the many charges that we that we try to help foster and lead is um, right. is just encouragement you know like to, to fan right. down the negativity and you know, <clears throat> these are all fez that you put in there that, uh, positivity being in that uh, that latest book social architecture you know when you talk about people or things don't talk about it in negative ways just People don't have to be that way. And right. so I'm not on a soapbox here, so I'll get down. But uh, again, Peter, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Uh, we definitely appreciate having you on the show today. And uh, with that, let's uh, let's call this show done and say goodbye. Adam, Jared, thank you so much. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks, Peter. Thanks.